You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Hi, I'm Mia Friedman. I'm a little bit sick, so I'm recording this from home, not in the studio, but this is no filter. I feel like I've let go of that identity as a sexual woman now. I just don't feel sexy anymore. Nikki Gamble doesn't want to have sex anymore. Not with her husband, not with anyone. And after she wrote about it in her regular newspaper column in the Australian magazine a couple of weeks ago, it sparked a viral conversation among Gen X women who were sharing it like crazy in their group chats. It wasn't just the idea of taking sex off the table that ignited conversations, but women also responded overwhelmingly to what Nikki wrote about her hunger for solitude within her marriage and within her family. She wrote about wanting a room of her own inside her house and about feeling like she'd been giving so much for so long to so many people that she was just done. 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 So what does it mean in a marriage when one person decides to change the rules in the middle of the game and announces they're done with sex? Is it fair? On the other hand, is it fair to expect your partner to have sex with you if they're just not that into it? Sex used to be a non-negotiable in a marriage or a long-term romantic relationship, but that's just not necessarily true anymore. Not according to Nikki, who's always been delightfully candid about her sex life. Over the years, it just tailed off, I think, with just exhaustion. She's the author of the world-famous best-selling erotic novel, The Bride Strip Bear. But as you're about to hear, a lot has changed in the 20 years since it was released. You're going to love this conversation. Nikki genuinely has no filter and she's possibly the perfect podcast guest. So let's talk about sex with Nikki Gemmel. Here she is. Nikki, when was the first time you had sex? I was a daggy little thing because I went to a convent school and I was desperate to have sex for years and years and years. But of course, nothing ever happened until first year uni when I finally got together with someone and it was just awful. And it is seared into my brain because I had- Talk me through it. Oh my God. I had spent like four or five years dreaming of this moment, just desperate to get rid of my pesky virginity. What did you think it would be like? Oh, I thought it would be everything that I, you know, read about from, you know, Jane Eyre through to (laughs) Wuthering Heights through to Rebecca. Did you read or see anything from, you know, this century (laughs) at all? (laughs) Well, it's me, Mia. It is me. But, you know, there was Judy Bloom as well and there was Judith Grants and and there was Colleen McCulloch, the Thornbirds, Mm. you know, all that kind of stuff. So I was expecting the big, passionate, ten. Tender, tender, tender fireworks. So anyway, he was a dude that I met in the drama club at my university and we went out and it was so dehumanising. So basically we were over at a friend's of his house one evening. It was about six of the lads. He just peeled me off. Were you dating or yeah, did we you were like dating. him? Oh, you were, yeah, you were yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, you know, this was the one because that's my mm. mistake. I always fall in love with someone and think they're the one and plan the wedding and the babies and every the life basically. So that's what I thought with the first guy I ever fell in love with. Anyway, at one stage he just peeled me off to a bedroom and it was quick, it hurt, it was profoundly untender, it was ugly and it was just such a letdown and it was over too quickly and I will never forget what happened afterwards. And also I'm incredibly modest and hated people seeing me naked and no one had ever seen me naked before. But also I was imagining this invisible camera on the roof kind of in a way that it was like I had to position myself for God knows who, that, you know, Mm. it was like I was overthinking everything as I always do. It's funny you say that because when our generation had sex, We didn't have a million images of other people having sex Mm. in our minds. Mm -mm. In most cases, we had never seen a porno. No. We might have seen a Playboy, so we might have seen other people naked, Mm -mm. but we didn't have that. And yet you still were 
looking from outside, imagining yes. what you looked like. So self-conscious, mm. crippled by self-consciousness. But anyway, it was his gesture afterwards that is seared into my brain, which just changed the equation completely for me. So we walked out of that room and he looked across at his five mates who were all 18, all first year uni, and he raised his finger at them in triumph like, I can't, you know, I can't do it on radio. Like but middle like, finger. Like middle finger, like I've just fucked up. And in that moment, everything shifted from this, oh, my God, my first boyfriend, this is amazing, we're going to spend the rest of our lives together, to, oh, my God, I am just a hole to him. I'm yeah. just a conquest. I'm just some... University fuck, another notch on the board mm. that he can just like say, yeah, I fucked her. Oh, the I betrayal did it. of that. Oh, and wow. it was my virginity and it was my first time and I'd wanted it to be so, so special. And, you know, I look at the young women around me now, I look at my daughter and I just hope that they never have an experience like that because that coloured my sexual history for the rest of my life. I still remember that night so clearly and I've tried to run away from that kind of experience ever since. But actually all through uni, I did four years of uni at that stage, I kept on having these bleak and lonely one-night stands that it was that kind of experience all over again, a complete absence of tenderness and proper connection because I feel like there's a profound spirituality almost with sex that really, really works. There's no deeper connection between two people. But it didn't take me until my maybe mid to late 20s to find that. Not everyone feels that way. Of course, I romanticise everything. I was talking to a young woman the other day who mm. was explaining to me that she identified as pansexual mm. and I said, explain that to me. And she said, it means sex to me is about knowing the person. Which sounds okay. like what you say. It's that spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if they're male or female. None of that matters to me. It's about the person. So I'm not physically attracted to someone if I see them across a room. I have to get to know them first. Did you ever have sex where you could split how you felt physically with how you felt emotionally? Did you ever have any satisfying casual sex in your life? Never. Never, because for me that is not what sex is about. You're not built for that. No, and and that is probably why I feel very old within this world, but also I feel like why would I bother with that kind of sex? Because for me it's sex of the mind too. It's a deep and profound explosive connection between two people for me, and I know that everyone's different and everyone sees it differently. And perhaps that's why I spent my university years having incredibly bleak one-night stands because the guys I was with were looking for that kind of sex and I never was. And so I'd have sex with them once. I never came. I'd never had an orgasm. I became very, very good at pretending that I'd had an mm. orgasm because I was the pleaser as so many of us are as young women, so I wanted to please the bloke. And You'd wanted... read your sex tips in Cosmo yeah, and Cleo and Dolly. And, Dolly. Or we and, and yeah. you know, so I wanted to big up the bloke and make him feel good. But for me it was always, oh, is that it? Oh, really? When What's did you first have an orgasm? You never masturbated? No. Oh, look, I'm blushing. Oh, me, I'm such a little daggy convent girl. When did you have your first orgasm? I can't remember if it was in my mid-20s or my late 20s because I'm trying to think if it was the boyfriend that broke my heart I was almost going to get married to and I got jilted because that was great sex or if it was my husband who I'm still with now and that was great sex too. So it was both kind of older men in their mid-20s or late 20s. Who knew what they were doing. Who knew what they were doing, who knew how to please a woman. Oh, and there was also the lovely man Martin down in Antarctica. He was much older. He was like 10 years older. He was so so experienced and I'd never had sex like that before because it felt like it was totally about a woman's pleasure. It was totally generous sex and I could see that he got pleasure from that. Yeah. It was such 
a spirit of generosity. And that was that a was revelation like, to that you. That was a revelation. And so I was learning from these older men. But I realised it takes fine-tuning. And for me, so I lost my virginity, I was 18, but it wasn't until maybe 28. So it was like 10 years of fine tuning. Of bad sex. To actually enjoy sex. Mm. And I remember my grandmother, you know, she said to me once when she was very old in her 80s, oh, Nikki, I've never enjoyed sex. And I just thought at the time, wow, she's gone through her whole life, two husbands, you know, ever, ever many other sexual encounters, didn't like a single bit of it. And I thought, you know, maybe that will be me. And it wasn't eventually, but it was like, God, I had to work hard to actually find Mm. sex that was generous and empowering and tender. That's my big thing. When I read D.H. Lawrence, Lady Chatterley's Lover, you know, I think the original title for that was Tenderness. It's all about tenderness. Was there some stirring when you read those books? No, no, no. No no, stirring. No stirring because it was completely intellectual. It was looking in D.H. Lawrence's mind. And so, I don't remember those bits. <laughs> no, the whole philosophy of Lady Chatterley's lover is that Melor's the gamekeeper. His whole thing is tenderness. Maybe I watched the movie. Oh, yeah, the Netflix one that's just come out is great. Very hot. It's very hot. But I want to go back to what you said about you went to a convent. You're a <laughs> convent girl. Yes. I don't know you as a religious person, <laughs> but... Were you taught to believe that sex was sinful, that sex was something that should only be used for having babies? Like what did you internalise about sex? In fact, those nuns were fucking hot chicks, you know. They were, I mean, not lesbian feelings for them, but they were empowered women because they knew what they wanted in life. They had made a choice. They followed through with it. They were women doing exactly what they wanted to do. But I'm talking about the messages you got about sex and the point of sex. But that flows on. So basically at my convent school we had sex education with the nuns and people were like, you know, oh, my God, nuns are teaching you sex ed. I remember one of them, you know, she'd tell us in sex ed that she always – knew when she was ovulating because she'd be at the kitchen sink and she'd feel a tweak in her ovaries. And she also told us about the rhythm method of Catholic convent. Which but, is all about working out when you're ovulating, not having sex at that time. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's withdrawal. Because were you taught that contraception is a sin? Yeah. Well, you know what? It's funny because I always felt like these nuns were actually quietly just teaching us a very empowered way to have sex. Mm. They made it that sex could be pleasurable and all those kind of things. I actually felt like these were empowered women telling me about sex in a non-threatening, non-judgmental but extremely practical way and I was very grateful for that. Mm. But I was just this weird little librarian nerd, bookish little thing. So, you know, I was never in the cool group at school. I was the little daggy little brainiac ones that, you know, we'd uh, boys weren't in mm. our world. Before basically. you wrote The Bride's Trip Bear, mm-hmm. you wrote Cleave and mm-hmm. Shiver mm-hmm. and there was one more. Love Song. Love Song. Mm. I loved all those books. It was oh, way before I you. met you. I loved them. And I remember that they had great sex scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Were you still writing from your imagination then? I was informed by what I'd found. Yes, yes. Shiva, particularly my first novel. So that was about your sexual about, awakening, essentially. Yes, that, that, with that was, guy in the Antarctic. Exactly. That was the generous man who mm. wanted to see a woman orgasm, knew if she was faking. It was like a challenge for him. But it was fantastic because it's win-win mm, for us. Very win. And he would get off on that and it was just wonderful sex. So, yes, those kind of experiences with the older men informed those first three novels. After the break, Nikki talks about her early days of her marriage, including good sex and vibrators and what's changed since then. What made you write The Bride's Trip Bear? your anonymous, very sexy (laughs) novel. It was kind of a precursor to Fifty Shades, really. Yeah, yeah. Why did you write it? Well, I had this idea after my fourth book that I wanted to write something completely different. I wanted to write completely honestly about sex within marriage. But I found that I was just being, because I was newly married at that stage. I just had a baby. 
we were living as Aussie expats in London. It was a very kind of small, enclosed little world, didn't have many people around us. So I wanted to protect that world. And I knew if I wrote very, very honestly about sex within marriage, life would crash into that world. People would assume I was writing about my husband, who I dearly love. And I just wanted to protect everything. So I started writing it and thinking this is not singing because it's not honest. And you know as yeah. well as anyone, darling, that power comes through honesty. Mm-hmm. That's how we connect to people. Mm. And so I didn't know how to make the book sing. I felt like such a failure as a writer. I feel like that every time I write a book. But this one particularly, it was like this is just dead in the water. And anyway, I was reading Virginia Woolf, A Room of One's Own, and she had a little sentence in there, anonymity is a woman's refuge. And as soon as I read that, it was like the key that unlocked the door into honesty. And I just thought, I will write this book but pretend I'm not going to be a part of it. I'm not going to have my name on the cover. No one will know it's me. So I can be very, very honest about sex within a deep relationship. But also it was drawing on all those years of bleakness, that first, you know, losing my virginity situation, Mm all the loneliness that I'd felt sleeping with guys where it wasn't working for me, it wasn't generous, I wasn't having an orgasm, I didn't Mm. know what an orgasm was. I knew what I wanted, I knew how I wanted it, but for some reason I was too mute within the sexual landscape to ever articulate what I wanted because I didn't want to push the guy away. I didn't want to scare him off. Whatever it was, I was too meek. I was too nice. It was like Edith Wharton talked about a curtain of niceness that befalls young women after they reach puberty. And, you know, I had that curtain of niceness for about 10 or 15 years over me from my mid-teens onwards. And it wasn't until my late teens that I was like, oh, fuck it. And just, you know. late 20s. Yeah, late 20s. And it was like, oh, fuck it. You know, I just need to be honest here. The bride strip there was fiction. Yes. It wasn't a memoir. No, but there were lots of honesty in it. Of, and informed a lot of people, by your experience. Yes, a lot of people assume For those it. people who haven't read it, can you sort of briefly describe some of the things that happen in it? Like what's the book about? Okay, it's about a, a young married woman who's completely disillusioned by her whole sexual world and sexual experiences. It's like, what is this? Why aren't I feeling what I thought I would feel? Blah, blah, blah. She finds a man, a man who is a virgin secretly. He's a sports person, so he's beautiful body and out there in the world and all the rest of her deeply religious. He's just never done it. So she instructs him through a series of letters. So it's basically a woman training a man mm, to please to, her. To please her, to do exactly what she wants, where and how, for how long or for how short. That's another thing I always hated. It goes on too long. It's like, oh, my God, it's like Sting and that tantric sex that goes on for nine hours. You'd get chasing. Are you kidding? That's Ah, my worst nightmare. Yeah, exactly. I mean, unless it includes dinner and a movie. Well, exactly. But, you know, after 20 minutes, after But it's funny you say that it goes on too long because when you were describing how you like sex to be and spiritual Mm -mm. and amazing, Mm -mm. like, Nick, that sounds like a lot of hard work. Sometimes you want a beautiful, delicious gourmet meal. Yeah, yeah that will transcend, you know, your palate. And other times Macca's drive-through really hits the spot. Oh, absolutely. But I'm talking about the thrusting if that goes on too long. Oh, yeah, not too much (laughs) thrusting. So within, not at all, so within a long-term relationship Mm. and married sex, Mm. there are ups and downs. Oh, my God, everything (laughs) sounds like a cliche. But when did you sort of come to terms with the fact, or did you ever, of how married sex might look for you? Oh, look, we had amazing married sex. My husband, I think he'd done a lot of reading maybe. I don't think it could be complete instinct and I don't know that he was informed by other lovers who were older women, but for some reason he just knew what to do where. Was he older than you? uh, No, no, he was born in the same year as me. He's about eight months older than me. Okay. But he was the one who introduced me to vibrators, used to give me a new vibrator every year. He, like my Antarctic dude, got pleasure out Mm. of seeing a woman have pleasure. It is such a gift. I had the most 
amazing, mind-blowing sex of my life as a married woman until we had kids. Mm. And then we had four kids. Over a long period of time. Over a long period of time. And, yeah, we were still having sex and we were still having mind-blowing sex. But over the years it just tailed off, I think, with just exhaustion. Mm. We were just both of us so tired. You know, I feel like we deeply love each other. I get all emotional. I I just, um, we deeply, deeply love each other, but we find our intimacy and our connection in other ways now besides sex. Mm. Do you remember the last time you had sex? A long time ago. A long, I don't want to say. A long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. The thing with having children that changes, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is the, particularly for the mother, it's so physical. Yes. So in good ways and bad, like the affection, the cuddles, the Mm-mm. I remember saying when my kids were smaller, I just need an hour when no one is touching mummy. Yes. Including yes. daddy. Yes, no one. Yes, yes. It's that sense of your body belongs to everybody. It's yes, your invasion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And in good ways and bad. But in other ways you are sated in some ways by the, the physicality of it. Mm-hmm. Although not sexually, but you know, affection wise. And then there are other aspects too, like just not having privacy, particularly when you've got kids of different ages. Mm -mm. Someone's up early, someone's up late. Mm -mm. And everyone's walking in and out of your bedroom. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you had co-sleepers as well, oh, but all the t- in and yeah, out of your bed. Completely. We still do swap around beds all the time. Yeah. We've done, you know, swap around beds for, oh, it's been 20 years for me now. And also I would say physically how your body changes. I've had four vaginal births. My third one, my daughter, she ripped me from vagina to anus. It's like a war zone When two there. holes become one. Yeah, it's like Syria down there. Mm. It's just, you know, oh my God. So, you know, with my fourth child, I got pregnant at 44. I thought when my period stopped, I was going through early menopause. I was like, yes, 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 finally, 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 the freedom of the other side. (sighs) And when I realised I was pregnant, it was like, oh my God, at 44. How old were you? Are the three children at that uh, stage? I think there's 11 years between the eldest and yeah. the I've youngest. Yeah, I've got an 11 year gap between it's eldest big, and youngest too. Isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. is because you are so far out of that zone. Yeah. And then you're thrown back. And it's oh. funny, I got pregnant around the same time. Actually, there would have been an even bigger gap. And I really wanted the fourth. Oh, and my yeah. husband really didn't. And mm-hmm. I talked to you about it when we were deciding what to do. Mm-hmm. And you were like, I can't remember what you told me. You said I was tired. You said you were tired. (laughs) And anyway, I had a miscarriage, so we didn't have to make that decision. But it's also your identity. You know, your identity as a sexual woman, it can be hard to flip that switch from mummy and mum and, you know, all the the difficulties Mm -mm. and just the identity of being a mother to – being a sexy woman. I feel like I've let go of that identity as a sexual woman now. I just don't feel sexy anymore. And whether that's the menopause. Tell me about that. Tell oh, me the menopause. God, Are I you through lost. the other side no. and what's it done to you? I'm still bleeding. I'm 56 and I had a period about a month ago, but it's all over the place. You know, I hadn't had for three months before that. But what happened, I just have not felt myself for about six or eight years. Sounds like Perry. Oh, God. And it's the loss of confidence. Mm-hmm. I've lost my waist. I've mm-hmm. got thick, I've got these big bulbous breasts like shelves and I've got these big arms and across here I'm like, oh, and the thighs, I'm like the Venus of Willendorf. And I was always this skinny little thing and I, I've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease, which is thyroid thing. So it's no matter what I do, no matter how little I eat, I'm just getting thicker and thicker and thicker and I shouldn't care about it so much. I know I should Intellectually we know we shouldn't oh. care and also intellectually we know there's Like I can admire all shapes and sizes of different Mm -hmm. women, but I I think it's when you feel like this isn't the body that you're used to. Like I've got enormous breasts too now and I think they're lovely on other women, but Mm. I don't feel like they belong to me. Oh, I just want to chop mine off. Like, oh. Uh, Yeah, I just don't. Exactly. It feels like you're in someone else's skin Mm. and I agree also with the loss of confidence, complete loss of confidence. Oh. Total loss of confidence. Really? Complete loss of confidence. Oh, you because we're at the age where society tells us to get in the bin. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. 
I was in the library yesterday working, writing, and I had a room to my own, with the, you know, about 20 chairs in it. And this dude walks in and he starts to have a business conversation really loudly. And it's like he just doesn't see me on his laptop. And then at the end of it, I just said really quietly, oh, this is a library. Do you mind if you just go out into, you know, just outside the doors of the library to have your conversation? He abused me and started Mm. filming me. (gasps) I felt assaulted and I just put my hands over my face and I was trembling. And then he said, well, you go away, you get out of this room. And then it was the menopausal lioness in me thinking, fuck this, I got here first. I had the really good spot. I'm really happy here. I didn't move. Eventually he left. Then... I had the room to myself again. Then another young guy came in and did exactly, started having a huge conversation about his gym membership again. And it was like, of course, being the female, I doubted myself. So what am I doing wrong? So have libraries changed? Have libraries now become business centres? What am I meant to do? Okay, I'll just let the guy have his go and I'll just sit here meetly, quietly, not working, quietly seething. This is what I've done my whole life. And then he left too. And then afterwards as I was leaving, I just said to a librarian, you know, have libraries changed? Am I like this really weird Mm. old thing that thought libraries were for quiet working? Mm. She said, no, 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 it's always the men who do this. And it's funny that the whole thing about the Karen as well, how it's become this idea that a woman who speaks her mind, who's not young Mm -hmm. and hot, Mm -hmm. is a figure of derision to be mocked and disdained. Or assaulted or abused or filmed. And it was shocking to me. It's like I never want to be this person but I just – and I spoke to him actually really politely and and it was just like – I thought libraries were for silence, but it's interesting this idea also of visibility. You know, he made we, me feel invisible. There's an understanding that flirting, even when you're in a long term committed relationship, can be really healthy Mm-mm. because it reminds you, you know, when you're talking with your partner about the milk and the electrician and the, Mm-mm. you know, phone bill. You don't feel very sexual, but then sometimes you might go out in the world and have an interaction with someone. Mm-mm. They might just look at you, or you might have a little bit of light flirting. And it's a reminder that, oh, yeah, that's right, I am a sexual being. Esther Perel says people don't have affairs because of the other person. It's because they're nostalgic for who they used to be, that that idea of the sexual side of themselves. Yes, because sometimes I'm in the car with my daughter, particularly in summertime, and I've got my hair down and they can't see my body at all and I'm driving and, you know, we'll have dudes just like kind of catcalling or whatever. It makes me feel amazing. Alive. I know. Alive. Yeah, it's like I, know. I get off on that feeling for several days. I bore my family senseless with the fact that I just got catcalled, even though I've written for years about, you know, wolf whistles and, and everything. And don't do that yes. and it's terrible street <laughs> yeah, harassment. But when it goes away, oh. I, agree. I actually thought that street harassment had stopped. I'm like, isn't yeah, that great? Yeah. Feminism, they've finally listened to us. <laughs> they've stopped. And then I was with my daughter <laughs> and I just realised, oh, it's just stopped for me. Exactly. It hasn't stopped. Exactly. And so in terms of, of the conversations you're having with other women your age, mm-hmm. as you wrote about in your column, mm-hmm. what are you hearing and noticing about the fact that women are not getting their demands necessarily met in their marriages anymore at this age? We're starting to split off from the men. What are the differences? I feel, well, I feel like all around me there are women wanting either rooms of their own bedrooms of their own. There are snoring situations, either the bloke snores or she snores, but they want their sleep because they are so tired. And whereas perhaps a generation, you know, ahead of us and and all the generations ahead of us would have just put up with it because that's what you do. Now we're angling to get not only the separate bedroom or living quarters, the separate houses. Mm. So, What do you think that's about? You talked I, about Virginia Woolf, a room of, yeah. of one's own. Yeah. Why? Like why? For our serenity and our sense of self. I find for me personally, my husband and I are going off in different directions as we age. He's very much the homebody and the family person and that's beautiful. It's like that's wonderful. He just gets all his satisfaction from being at home with the family, being there for the kids and work. That's Mm -hmm. kind of work, home, that's it for him. For me, as my youngest, he's now 11, but he's moving into independence as he gets into those high school years, 
I finally, after like 22, 23 exhausting years of motherhood, just want to seize the world with girlfriends. And so I've basically said to my husband, we had this conversation last year, I've got a few single chick girlfriends, divorce, whatever, they've got subscriptions to the theatre or they like going to a film regularly or whatever it is, and they're like, Nikki, can you be my plus one? And I'm like, sure thing. And so I basically trooped home to my husband last year and I said, you know, blah, blah, blah. She wants me to go to the theatre with her on her subscription every year because she had got that for a boyfriend of hers and then they broke up. So she needs me to accompany her. So I said, can we now do our relationship that we just do separate social lives? So I am going to be like a divorced woman out in the world. See, I've always had that. Girl. Oh, it's bliss. Did you used to it? do everything as a couple or your social life? Yeah, socialising. particularly when we were younger and we were expats mm. in London and all that kind of thing. But isn't that healthy? Just living oh, yeah. it to, yeah. Oh, I suppose my husband and I also work together. So for us... It's the, like, I see my girlfriends, yeah. he sees his mates yeah, and yeah. his female friends and yeah. whatever, and, and we, of course, we do family things together. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes we have some couple friends. But, no, it's it, that's funny that you've come to that quite late. Yeah, I have come to that quite late, but it's kind of like I feel like it's post the whole child-rearing yeah. madness where you had to be the couple. You had yeah. to be the couple at school dinner. So it's feeling it liberated is. from the constraints of uh, what a even, wife and a partner yeah. is meant to be. Yeah, and I think mm. it also is about having a lot of girlfriends who divorced yes I'm in the same space like there's very few of my friends that are still married Mm -mm. and it's funny because all of my girlfriends who are divorced none of them want to live with a man again no my mother was like that because she got divorced when I was 10 11 and then she had a boyfriend afterwards for about 10 years he wanted to marry her and she just said nah and then she said to me Nikki they're so boring all they want to do is talk about themselves or have sex and that was it. And so I learned that from my mum. That's yeah. being very harsh. But I just feel like and something else I've discovered that I wrote about in this column was a lot of women, we want to seize the years we have left and do all those things we never had the chance to do, you know, like travel or a course or go back to art school or whatever it is. You so know. While, while men are often, see, as we lose our estrogen, Mm-mm. the estrogen is our accommodating hormone. It's, mm. it's about being liked. It's about fitting in with everybody. Yeah, oh, as that, that drops, yeah. <laughs> we are suddenly more able to speak our minds and get in touch with what we want. But interestingly, at the same time, men's testosterone is dropping, so they become less interested in being in the outside world. Yes. Again, this is a big generalisation, but just in mm, terms yeah. of it's no accident what you're talking about, that men often turn to their wives Mm-mm. at the same time as wives are turning away, are turning turning from away and turning not necessarily away from them because they don't love them, but just yeah. wanting a different life or a different pace of life. Yeah, yeah. So basically what I'm discovering is all these around me, these short-term, long-term relationships. Explain what they are. Oh, it just sounds bliss to me. So basically you're in a deeply loving relationship with someone. Committed. A long-term committed monogamous. relationship. Monogamous relationship. Just committed to each other completely, but you do not live together. And so you have two separate houses, you do your own thing, you come together for short term bursts, it might be holidays or something like that, you know, intense weeks, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to your separate lives and you've got this separate aesthetic, you've got different levels of tidiness, you can maintain your own space, you're not getting irritated by that other person because they love the clutter or they hate the clutter and you love the clutter. So, you know, you're not constantly compromising. Compromising. And I think that gives you a really solid foundation of like centeredness within a relationship. I don't have that and I can't afford that. So this for me is It's very privileged, yeah, isn't it? It's Would be. very, very privileged. It's a world that is beyond my reach in any way. But I look at people who sustain this and, and, and divorce friends mm. so that they're with, you know, another yeah, they've divorced got long-term person partners, yeah, who's, but- who's got their own house and they're just not choosing to have their lives together. And I think, well, post-kids, why would you in a way? We have more for you if you're a Mamma Mia subscriber. I asked Nikki to stick around because I wanted to talk to her about how her husband feels about their post-sex life together. Is he on the same page? If he was to have an affair, would you be sad? Or it's like, no, because I'm, I've let go of that part yeah, of our no, no, relationship. No, because I love him so deeply and I care for him so much. 
The answer was really not what I expected to be, and there were tears. You can listen to that bonus episode for subscribers via a link in the show notes. And we'll also link to Nikki's article that sparked this whole conversation. The producer of No Filter is Emmeline Peterson. Our executive producer is Eliza Ratliff, with sound production by Madeline Juano. I'm Mia Friedman. Thanks for having my croaky voice in your ears.